Hello and welcome to this important digital discussion on the future of work in Southeast Asia, co-hosted by the UK ASEAN Business Council and the ASEAN Business Advisory Council. <coughs> I'm Alan Lai with the UK ASEAN Business Council based in Brunei and have mm. a few housekeeping notes for you before we begin. We will shortly be hearing from experts from both the UK and Southeast Asia. However, the richness and vibrancy of the discussion will also depend on you, our guests. So please feel free to ask questions, which you can do in the question function in your screen, and our chair will field as many as possible. You're all on mute and will mm -hmm. not be able to ask questions verbally. If you are tweeting, please do tag us at UK ASEAN and also at ASEAN underscore BAC. Our chair for the discussion today is Baroness Neville Rolfe, chair of the UK ASEAN Business Council. Baroness Neville Rolfe has had three careers, including a career in government, serving as UK minister, a career in business, serving on the board of Tesco, and is currently enjoying a career in politics, serving in the House of Lords. Thank you once again to all of you for joining us. Our chair will introduce the session, our co-hosts, and our discussion to follow. Baroness Neville Rolfe, over to you in London. Alan, thank you so much. Um, and for those of you who know me, I've got an absolute passion for the Asian region, I've spent, ASEAN region, I've spent a lot of time there, both as a minister and when I was uh, an executive at Tesco. Um, and of course, the UK uh, ASEAN Business Council is here to champion the ASEAN-UK relationship at this very important time. Um, and I think we're well linked to government. Our foreign secretary uh, visited ASEAN on his very first visit when he was appointed. I think welcome to you all. For some it's morning, for some it's afternoon. And thank you especially Dr. Kwong and the ASEAN Business Advisory Council for co-hosting today's important conversation. I mean, there are, there are a number of themes that I'm sure will come through. Technology and the fourth industrial revolution is of course changing the industry landscape completely, both here in the UK and in Southeast Asia. The, the curveball of COVID-19 has probably accelerated that change. Um, and I think there's some obvious questions that will arise this morning. Is there a new normal of work? Is there a change? How has technology changed skills development? Will lifelong learning become a necessity? I'm sure it will, having done a lot of it myself. Um, and, uh, you know, will there be shorter alternatives, for example, to the traditional MBA program. And as ASEAN moves up the value chain, becomes more and more important in the world economy, what are the key industries in ASEAN and what skills are needed to support them? So I'm very delighted to introduce our first speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Kwang is in Hanoi uh, to give him his welcome remarks. Um, he is, of course, uh, the Distinguished Chairman of the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, um, a role he played for the second time, actually, because he started in 2010, so, so years of experience, um, uh, in contrast to my own relative newness, but equal enthusiasm. And, of course, he's Vice Chairman of the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which represents the business community in Vietnam and promotes international Dr. Kwong, over to you for our welcome remarks. Thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon from Hanoi. And uh, first of all, I would like, uh, on behalf of uh, the ASEAN Bar and the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to thank UKABC and especially Madame Baroness for the cooperation in uh, organizing today's webinar. And uh, I think that today's webinar, our meeting today, is, is very important because I think that all of you agree with me that the world is in which we are living is changing. Uh, people are talking about digital changes thanks to the technology improvement, progress. And also digital change coupled with the economic recession caused by the virus pandemic now taking place around the world and also in Asia. And all these things will change the way we live and especially 
the way we work. So that's why nowadays people are around talking about the future of work and future of our workers and labor force. And I appreciate personally the initiative of, of UK ABC for uh, to organize today's event. So I welcome all people to come to this event today. My colleagues, ASEAN Bank colleagues, Ian T, Robert, and other people, and also other people from UK and uh, from uh, any place in the world as well. And today we uh, will discuss about the job issue in ASEAN, especially. It's a region we call labor intensive uh, region. So that your future is very important for us to discuss in this time. And uh, in Asia, nowadays, we're talking about the challenge associated with the job, uh, future job of ASEAN people. And I do believe that in this discussion, my colleagues, Yanti and Robert, will talk to you about what's happening in ASEAN in general, and also about in Singapore, Brunei in particular. And uh, for Vietnam, as you may know that in Vietnam, the situation associated with the pandemic now is getting better. Thanks to the government policies associated with the social distancing restriction and things like that. Now the situation is getting better. We step by step normalize our life and our working life as well. And uh, ASEAN Bank, in this year, 2020, one of our biggest job is that we, we organize the ASEAN Biz, ASEAN Business and Investment Summit 2020 in Hanoi in the coming November. And ASEAN Bank mm -hmm. is organized and, uh, and, and uh, approved by the ASEAN governments. We are consisting of the uh, business leaders around ASEAN. You know, and our, our mandate is that we advise our government how to do and improve the business environment in ASEAN, help, help our business in ASEAN to uh, improve their uh, productivity and efficiency and things like that. So we try to organize many events and activities. And ASEAN Business 2020 is one of our biggest tasks in this year. And we expect to uh, receive business leaders and government leaders uh, in ASEAN and also ASEAN, ASEAN and also academic people, especially also hopefully from UK ABC to come and discuss about how we can, we can work together and help our businesses, especially in this situation. And hopefully situation will be much better and we can realize the event in Hanoi is coming November. And uh, as you may know that, of course, in the agenda of ASEAN Beach 2020, one of the main topics we will talk about future of work in ASEAN. And I think that today, topic and uh, webinar is very uh, complementary to what we try to work and discuss in the coming event. So hopefully, uh, we can do things and, uh, and, and, and talk about uh, the situation in ASEAN, especially as, about the future of work for ASEAN people in the coming time. And I think that today is uh, very important and uh, the topic also is very important, relevant to us. And we, I hope we can have very good, good discussion, good fruitful discussion, and uh, thank you again Madam Baroness and also UKBC for the initiative. And I wish today's gathering, this webinar, a success. And I wish we will have very fruitful discussion then. And thank you very much. And thank you for the time. Thank you. Dr. Quan, thank you. And, and might I uh, offer my congratulations for the way Vietnam has actually tackled the COVID-19 crisis. We, we read about your experiences in the UK. Um, with, with, much, with much envy. 
Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a little bit more, if I might, about the summit. Certainly the UK ABC is planning to attend the summit. I'm planning to come, bring a business delegation, um, and I hopefully am. people who are on this call. Um, mm -hmm. And it would be good to know how you think the future of work could feature in the work of the uh, Business and Investment Summit. Uh, I think uh, the uh, Business Summit, the idea is that, you know, we try to give the feedback to ASEAN leaders what happening in this year to the uh, ASEAN leaders. And also we try to gather the BC leaders and academic people to come and discuss about all issues, what are taking place in this year and try to uh, find out some kind of solution and uh, have uh, some kind of uh, initiative and things like that so that we can Right, we've lost the sound. Help our ASEAN business community to uh, go ahead. It's time to come. Also after the seminar, we can uh, uh, bring to the kind of event and maybe make a better contribution to the event, the coming event. Okay. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> and I think it will be good to, as you suggest, have the discussion right across ASEAN, whether it's technology, whether it's digital whether it's lifelong learning, all of these things will make a very good theme for November's summit. So thank you so much for that and for welcoming us this morning, Dr. Kwok. You've already mentioned the Onyanti Raman, and if I may, I will move on and invite her to give her opening remarks. Uh, Yanti is based in Brunei uh, and is the co-chair of the ASEAN BAC She's a Legislative Council uh, member in Brunei um, and a member of the ASEAN Future Workforce Council, today's theme, of course. She's a British trained architect and a very active member of the ASEAN Business Advisory Council. And she will be chair when Brunei hosts ASEAN after Vietnam. And again, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, Yanti, if I may, over to you for your comments. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Baroness, and thank you, UK ASEAN Business Council, for organizing this digital conversation series, Future of Work in Southeast Asia. So this is indeed the right time to discuss this topic during this unprecedented period in the human history to touch on the what is new normal after COVID-19. COVID so what we see is the evolution of workforce and business being disrupted. The escalation of the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic represented um, a global example of the fragility of the world in which we live in. And as to how vulnerable we are as a society to exceptional risks. Now, it remains to be seen how the systems will address these potential disparities while striving for economic stability. We would need a thorough social reconditioning to adopt this new normal as families, as communities, organizations, and also as nations. Now, we cannot allow ourselves to return to the pre-pandemic normality, and it is a necessity to prepare efficiently for future pandemics to avoid new viruses developing. Now, what's important is resilient workforce, greater speed, more adaptability, a heightened team focus, and new priorities. Organizations, should find ways to capture the energy and the rhythm of the recovery, setting a new pace, maintaining it, and instilling it at all levels. Now, while the situation in Brunei stabilized with the implementation of extraordinary public health measures, new cases are also rising everywhere in the world. We are very grateful to our government for their transparency and also huge, huge support. Now, COVID-19 could be seen as the catalyst which takes the evolution of work anywhere arrangements in ways that considerably improve opportunities to collaborate, to think, create, and connect productively. Now, company culture as well as um, leadership 
employee experience and also the whole digital workplace experience are now being put to test. So technology will always play a huge part in determining the success of the new ways of working. Over the past five years, ASEAN Business Advisory Council legacy project has always been about connectivity, digitalization, and also human resource. In 2015, when Malaysia um, started the legacy project, they touched on the fintech solution for ASEAN. 2016, Laos is on connectivity. 2017, Philippines is on maritime connectivity and also ASEAN Mentorship Entrepreneurs Network. 2018, Singapore on Smart Growth Connect. Thailand last year is ahead, which is ASEAN Human Empowerment and Development and Vietnam Digital Stars, ASEAN Digital Trade Connectivity Platform. And what we plan to do for Brunei is hired H-I-R-E-D, harnessing impact with relevant employables through digitalization. Now, what we're trying to address here is addressing the skill gaps. In ASEAN, stay relevant by realigning skills, bridging skills within ASEAN and enable ASEAN as a balanced supply. We all know that there is always a mismatch between the demand and supply of workforce and industry requirements. Remaining relevant workforce for a dynamic ASEAN, distributive and inclusive skills for ASEAN economy. Challenging but interesting as we are preparing for the legacy project for Brunei next year and preparation and also shaping towards the new normal. We understand the ability for talents to move across borders will always be challenging. To access pool of skilled talents in the emerging skills is also a challenge. Now, how do we access to talents virtually? By creating a virtual talent pool. Now, time taken for talent to cross borders will also be costs for companies. So there are so many things. The next thing that we probably need to look into is working virtually. How will physical versus virtual demography changes which we need to be adapted by these companies. Now in 2019, in, during the ninth regional policy dialogue concludes the formation of the ASEAN Future Workforce Council that is actually represented by the business and industry from each ASEAN state members in partnership with ASEAN Business Advisory Council under the Joint Business Council. <coughs> now it serves as a platform for proactive engagement with the relative sectorial bodies that includes SOMED and also SLOM. Um, this is to consider as integration with relevant elements of the future ASEAN agenda for Tibet in their future strategies and for the post-2020 work program. And under this ASEAN agenda, Tibet has always been recognized as an important element in strategies to close prevailing skill gaps. Yet, in practice, the school-based Tibet systems of ASEAN member states rarely meet expectations and Tibet graduates fail to live up to the demand and the business of the industry. Now, Baroness, I will actually end it here because I'm very looking forward for our the next of the discussion. Thank you. Angie, th yeah, thank you. That's so interesting. Um, one of the things that I'm conscious of is that ASEAN is made up of 10 very different countries. Um, mm. So the challenge is, is how do you um, improve skills right across such a big area. Um, and then even within the countries, you've got cities and you've got rural life, and they have yeah. different challenges. Could you comment on how we tackle that together? Yeah, I, I think in, in general, I mean, even if I look at Brunei currently, um, Brunei is currently ranked as number two in ASEAN for the ICT Development Index. So interesting fact is, every 75 in every 100 inhabitants in Brunei are using internet. So in fact, our active mobile subscription is recorded as 116 in every 100 inhabitants. However, during this pandemic time for online education, we found out that 40% of our students do not have the devices and access to internet. So even though it actually captures that we have that accessibility, but in fact, for education as such as online education, we don't have the capacity or enough to access um, all the internet. So I guess the problem is particularly severe for communities that are typically excluded, um, especially when we look at 
elite technical education pathway, especially in the rural area, most notably the women, rural people and other disadvantaged populations. Therefore, ASEAN economies um, should enhance the capacity to respond to skill shortages by encouraging inclusive innovation adaptation in the training of ecosystem. So um, in doing so, um, they will create more flexibility and responsive system and resources that can be deployed quickly as a new scale gaps that can be identified. Thank you. Yeah, Angie, thank you for that. And I think we'll come back to all those issues, uh, both now and Thanks. later in the year. And I'm now going to swiftly move on, thanking you, if I may, to uh, the panel discussion. Um, we've got a brilliant panel um, and the faces will come up. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in detail as they each speak. We've got Anthony Thompson, Dr. Robert Yap, Cindy uh, Rampasso, and Jonathan Ledger. And if I may, I'm going to invite Anthony um, and, and, and Robert to speak first and give us the business view on the future of work. So we're going to start with the business view. Um, and if I may briefly introduce Anthony, um, who's joining us from Singapore. Uh, we're getting right around the world today. Um, Anthony is a board director of Page Group uh, and head of its Asia uh, of strategy, um, which has grown to become, I think, one of the world's best known and most respected recruitment consultancies. Um, he's got a keen understanding of the future of work globally, um, obviously, especially in Asia, uh, which often has emerging trends of interest to the rest of the world. Anthony, over to you. Uh, you're on, you need to un unmute. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, Alan? Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay, I'll, I'll start again. Um, uh, thank you, Baroness. Hello to, uh, to everyone. Um, I, I've worked in in Asia with, with Paige for, for 20 years now. And there's one question that I get asked more than anything else, and that's, how is the market? Um, and as you might imagine, it's a reasonably complex uh, answer to give uh, at the moment. But as a recruitment company, I think we're really a, a barometer to, to some degree of what is going on in the market. And the, the decisions that employees make to recruit or in fact candidates make in terms of um, whether they're prepared to make a move is, is substantially influenced by um, market sentiment, market confidence, and uncertainty um, causes uh, significant delays in decision. So COVID-19 has very much had a, an impact across our 20 offices um, uh, in Asia, starting in, in, in China, as we all know. Uh, but I'm really pleased to say that um, from a few weeks ago, really, we're we're actually very much back up and running in China with our six offices um, fully operational and, and uh, activity levels are actually back to being quite reasonable. And I think that's very encouraging for the rest of, um, uh, of Asia and specifically ASEAN as we're discussing today. Uh, we're also seeing a, a great deal of activity from Chinese companies looking to recruit uh, in ASEAN, particularly within uh, technology and, and e-commerce related areas. Um, Pleasing to see that Vietnam is largely back uh, to uh, operating um, full time from this week, I believe, but other parts of ASEAN are in various stages of, of lockdown. But despite that, um, we do continue to see reasonable levels of activity in, um, in, in certain areas. And the exposure we have to literally thousands of, of, of clients and hundreds of thousands of candidates uh, does give us a bit of an insight also into what the plans are for people in terms of the future of work, which is a very, very popular topic. So where are we seeing demand? Well, not surprisingly, we're seeing quite a lot of demand uh, in areas related to the acceleration of digitalization. And that takes the form uh, of many particular job types. Um, also not surprisingly, healthcare and life sciences, both from a technical and commercial perspective, uh, is, is very positive. And we're starting to hear terms like telehealth used um, far more frequently, and I think we'll continue to see demand there. Uh, the world of FMCG uh, has also been active in, in, in certain, certain areas, along with food manufacturing, chemicals and packaging. Uh, and I think interesting for some of the conversations that we've 
going to have a little bit later, online education and digital learning is a particularly hot area and, and one where there's a real shortage of, of, of candidates. Um, in, in Singapore, um, financial services, albeit not the traditional bold bracket banks, more looking at fintech, um, insurance, private equity, has actually been quite active uh, and Singapore continues to focus on really trying to be a hub for, for innovation um, in terms of um, technology and digital and R&D in, in, in various areas. So um, along with that, and, and I think we're all aware that ASEAN is continuing to progress in terms of its position globally as a supply chain hub. Uh, and we're, we're, we're continuing to see uh, demand for candidates with, with strong skills in supply chain and also procurement, and those who are able to effectively na navigate different cultures and different um, demographics in terms of how they influence and how they negotiate. Um, many organisations are, are provided there in a, in a sound financial position, already looking forward and starting to get that balance right between navigating the short term, but also making sure they've got a great business shape uh, to move forward to and take advantage of, of opportunities in the future. And many see that there is going to be uh, a chance to, uh, to increase um, market share. Um, one other question I get asked a lot is, what do you think the key skills are going to be moving forward? And I think that could be a very long answer, which I, I won't give, give given that the time's very short, but there are, there are seven that I think really stand out based on what we're seeing across the region and what our clients are, um, are telling us. Um, the first of these is the ability to make the best use of available technologies and social media. This concept of digital literacy uh, is uh, con continuing to emerge and, and will, will continue to be more and more important. Customer, I'm thinking about CRM, customer relationship management, customer, uh, customer engagement and the ability to stand apart in what's an increasingly competitive world. Thirdly, sales, very old skill, but one that is actually in short supply in terms of genuine sales skills, the ability to really influence and, uh, and negotiate. We, we have, a, 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 moving on to the next one, we have a, we have a great um, benefit now with the amount of data that we have access to, but it's using the right data to make the right decisions that I think is going to be increasingly um, important for people in all sorts of roles and at all sorts of, um, of levels. It might sound a little counterintuitive, but despite the multitude of advance, advancements we've seen in technology, relationships are going to be more important than ever. Um, the ability to manage those relationships with agility, to influence and collaborate across borders, across cultures, across different demographics and the communication skills that go, go with that, I think will, will continue to be important. Um, looking back at the concept of learning, the, the appetite and the capacity to keep learning and adapting. Uh, and I think we're, we're going to talk about that a bit later, that would be critical. And then finally, innovation. Um, often related to technology, but it doesn't need to be. People needing to be innovative, or if not innovative, at least comfortable with change. Um, it's a very big topic. Uh, I could talk for a long time, but I've probably run out of time, Baroness. Anthony, Over that's you. fantastic. You've really got us going. What an excellent list. And I'd say on relationships, I've been struck by how relationships matter even more in, in, in Asia and ASEAN than they do in Europe or America. So um, it's interesting that your skills list is a mixture of what we had that the demands already and of the new. And actually that linking to that, um, I suppose I'd be interested in your view as to whether the coronavirus um, has and will accelerate further change um, in the way that we work and therefore in the skills that you're looking for um, in, with your candidates. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think yes is the answer, but I think the new normal was coming. Um, and, and what we've really seen through COVID-19 is a, is an acceleration <laughs> of um, uh, the way we work. COVID-19 has, to a degree, been a, a bit of a forced experiment for us in terms of dynamic working and, and working from home. And, and many organisations have actually found it to be more productive, I think, than they thought it was 
uh, it, it was going to be. Being said, there's a lot of people looking forward to uh, getting back into back into an office and leaving the confines of their of their, of their business. Um, our view, or well, my view on this, is that I think we will see some lasting changes from that, but I'm not sure it will be quite the revolutionary shift some people think just just yet. A couple of other points on that is the importance of the gig economy, the concept of temporary and contract employees. It's already quite advanced in Singapore, but it's less well ado adopted in other countries in ASEAN, and I think we're going to see that um, that will shift. Um, linked to that is a, is a newer newer term, which is the grey economy, uh, which I apparently I qualify for, uh, and and relates to the, the use of, of more <laughs> more experienced professionals on a project or or less than than, than permanent basis. Um, I mentioned data before, database decisions. We'll see, and I, I, I suspect we're going to see flatter organisation structures. Um, career paths will become less linear, um, and there'll be a greater need for agility and um, flexibility. Just finally, from a, a recruiter's perspective, um, talented candidates were already very discerning, and I think that will be even more so. Um, they will be particularly focused on a, a few concepts such as the identity and purpose of an organisation, and not just paying lip service to it, but genuinely embracing those, those values, a clear digital strategy, and a clear strategy in terms of the best use of technology. A sim similarly, a strategy for dynamic working, um, diversity and inclusion, a real genuine focus on health and well-being uh, and that overall employee experience. Um, and increasingly, more and more companies around the world are having to ensure they've got very sound policies and, um, and actions in, in relation to ESG, um, environment, social and uh, and governance. Um, so I think uh, they're, they're all concepts that were, were in play before COVID-19 and I think in many cases will have been accelerated by it. Yeah well thank you for that and I know that um, doing work on corporate responsibility when I was at Tesco's was obviously some years ago had this side effect of being very good for recruitment because people yeah. read the corporate responsibility report they were young people you know and they wanted to come and work for a good employer so that, that obviously continues post-COVID. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, I'm now going to invite Dr. Yak, if I might. Uh, hello, Robert. Um, Hi. Robert wears more hats than anybody, um, <laughs> so we're very grateful that he can join us today. Um, but he's president of the National Employers Federation in Singapore. So, you know, his feel for the work landscape is going to absolutely be crucial to our discussions. So, Robert, um, your thoughts on the future of work in Southeast Asia? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> well, this COVID uh, pandemic is really uh, causing a lot of uh, headaches, but uh, not necessarily all uh, all bad because it actually serves also as a very important wake up call for what we're trying to do in transforming our economies, our country, our industries, our enterprises, as well as our workforce. I think this, this uh, really put you on, on, on a, a, a faster shift uh, to see that uh, the dangers of not changing, uh, not being able to get there, uh, will actually impact you even uh, in a greater manner. So I think th this is something that, uh, that we are all taking this momentum to see how we can push uh, companies, industry to transform uh, even quicker. Um, if you look at Southeast Asia, I think there's one, um, I would say, in a way that you, we heard of uh, China plus one. So, so um, before the COVID thing, I think you look at the China, us, uh, China and the US situation. Then you realize that there's going to be a shift, right? The supply chain uh, manufacturing shift from uh, China into uh, the other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, India, even some other parts of the, the North Asia. But if you look at this shift, we actually provide a huge opportunity for Southeast Asia at this moment, right? So I think the supply chain shift is something that I thought that the future of work should be aligned to be able to, to sort of catch this swing and able to operationalize that. So I think this is a very important part for us to recognize that. Um, if you look at also this kind of a move, they are now going on in a very big way. Um, Japan, for example, is encouraging or even helping funding some of the enterprises to move that 
supply chain, the manufacturing supply chain from uh, China into uh, ASEAN. So that is a very uh, positive thing. Um, if you look at also at the part of it, but then are we, are we as ASEAN, right? Are we, um, are we ready? Are we able to be able to handle this uh, shift, right? So I think this is uh, also one of the very important uh, thing that we have to understand. Of course, future of work means that uh, we are, future of work do not really mean everything the same for every country. I mean, you mentioned earlier on that we have 10 countries in ASEAN. Each of us has a, a different level of development. I think this diversity, is it a plus or a minus? I think I've been answering this question many times because I've been sitting in the ASEAN Business Advisory Council for, for, for a long time now. And every time we come to this, uh, this question, a lot of people say that because of the diversity is actually a big disadvantage because we are at different levels of development. Right? But uh, I, I and many of the people actually believe that it's actually an advantage. Right? Because if you look at the different levels of development, actually, it only become a disadvantage if we cannot work together, right? If we work together and we work our connectivity, uh, it is actually a big advantage because each of us are in various parts of the value chain. So that is very important uh, thing that we should understand, which is why uh, it's, it's so important right, for ASEAN and the ASEAN economic community to get their act together. So this is one uh, thing that I thought would be uh, very important. And what are the kind of future of work if you see in this uh, readiness for the production Manufacturing uh, supply chain, for example. Um, I guess uh, the way we're looking at uh, Industry 4.0, how do we support manufacturing shift that comes in? All right, how do we actually upskill, reskill workers to be able, all right, uh, for this kind of a factories uh, operation to be shifting into our region? I think this is a part that I think uh, we have to actually pay a lot of attention to. Um, the other aspect that I thought would be very interesting is this. Um, you see, a country and a region grow depend very much on two engines. One is really the production engine, right? So a lot of time we talk about it. Look at, look at China itself. It grew, it grew and it grew so fast because of the manufacturing, right? The manufacturing production engine was cranking at top speed before the consumption engine comes in. Today, they are both cranking, all right? So, so in, in ASEAN, if we are playing our cards right, the production engine, we can take use of this wave or this shift to get it moving. At the same time, we also must crank up the consumption engine, all right, so that so that we don't get into situations where we are paying too much for our food or we are unable to get all kinds of a, a supply chain into the cities, and also to prevent our cities from growing at a rate where there are just too much pain. I look at any big growing city today, not just ASEAN, everywhere in the world, you will see every city growth is always coming with a lot of problems, all right. Uh, you talk about congestion, traffic congestion, you talk about pollution, you talk about all the kinds of things that you do not want to happen, right, uh, in a congested city, uh, that are there. So how do we prevent that? Uh, last year, or two years ago, when Singapore chaired ASEAN Business, uh, ASEAN itself, uh, and then the I concurrently chaired the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, we came up with the, with the legacy project, right, the ASEAN uh, Bug Legacy, which we named as uh, SG Connect, right, Smart Growth Connectivity. That is really to look at how to actually orchestrate infrastructure, smart development, skills training, and so on, to take the country in ASEAN, all right, and then integrate as a region to be able to move up the value chain without or with less uh, green pain, right? So that the cities are growing with lesser green pain, right? Avoiding all the kinds of problems that we talk about. So these are the area, and with this happening, means that you have to look at how the future of work is going to play in all this, right? Whether it's a consumption engine or the production engine. A large part of it is really more in the digitalization, right? The area of technology, right? So how do we uh, train our people to be able to adopt technology, to be able to be uh, used or, 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 or rather not shy, right? Of using technology uh, to make this happen. I think it's very important. COVID-19 has got the impact of doing that, actually. If you look at it today, a lot of us, if we don't play with technology, for example, it's very hard for us to get into this kind of a conversation too, right? So we get to be more familiar, we know how to exploit the Zoom, the Microsoft team, your webcam and so on. Even though it's already happening for many years, but very few people are really doing it like a way of life, right? So in Singapore, for example, we've been locked down for coming to one and a half months. 
and uh, and without this kind of tool, we will all be totally uh, from the business point of view, <laughs> probably um, dead. We cannot move. You know, we cannot do anything. But from a social point of view too, you know, I have friends that are going around using this as a way of let's have a happy hour. You know, that kind of thing. So we will be taking my whiskey, and Anthony can be there, and we can say cheers. You know, let's have <laughs> let's have a drink. So all this kind of thing is technology, right? So how do you get to people to be familiar with technology? And then today, hopefully that now we are familiar because we are forced to actually uh, more than normal. Uh, can we keep this momentum and take us right up to that technology level? That is very important for us as a foundation for whether you are going to be able to take advantage of the production engine cranking up or you're able to take the consumption engine to a total fulfillment where you can embrace e-commerce, the O to O, you know, and all those kind of uh, digitalization efforts that we are talking about. So I think it's very critical. This is a very good uh, time uh, to look at it. So I thought uh, it's very interesting time for us, for us to 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 take this uh, kind of a parameters and understand what future of work actually mean. All right, and how do we build up our institutions, our foundation to be able to scale as we move up together in terms of the requirements for future of work because future work depends on future jobs so what are the future jobs and uh, also depend on what are the surviving industries what are the target of those uh, businesses that you know will be future ready against businesses that are actually coming down so i think these are the thing that everybody is uh, looking at now even especially for us as a businessman we have to be always there looking at uh, 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 um, Doing the right thing, right? On the area where the industries, where the economy is growing, rather than the area that you are facing a kind of a, 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 a diminution, right, of importance in that sector. So that's an area that I thought uh, I would uh, be very willing to share, and maybe we can have uh, more discussion on that later on. Yeah, Robert, thank you very much. And as you say, we need to move on to the discussion. We run a little bit behind. I mean, my question to you was going to be about COVID 19, which you've answered <clears throat> yeah. brilliantly. Is there anything that you want to add? before we move on to the education experts. Yeah, I, I, I just thought that maybe I would like to share um, last year, last year Singapore uh, hosted uh, this um, Future of Work conference, right? Uh, this is actually together with the ILO and so on. Um, and the key topics were about technology, embracing technology, about tripartism. A lot of people, um, I'm just wearing my hat as the National Employers Federation uh, head here. Um, Tropatism a lot of time is taken for granted, right? So I think this is very important, the role of tropatism in promoting what we call sustainable and inclusive growth, right? And also, how do we ensure an agile and future ready workforce? So these are the three topics that we discussed. So with this uh, pandemic now, I think uh, the three issues have become even more pressing, right? For businesses to stay uh, afloat and also workers to stay employed. So in Singapore, we are actually uh, doing quite a lot to respond to that. Um, firstly, one lesson that we learned from the COVID-19 is that we must not wait for crisis to happen, all right, uh, to emerge from this. We should start transforming even before that. So businesses which has embraced technology uh, earlier are able to cope. Let me give you an example. Um, we have been pushing uh, retail transformation in Singapore. We think that the old uh, stalls, uh, retail and all that, without any e-commerce front, it's not going to survive, right? So they have to start up something like that. So you have companies that are in the process of doing that, they start up an e-commerce front, but they don't do a back-end integration. So what happened? The picking of the product, when you buy on the e-commerce front or you go to the store, now you can't go to the store because of our COVID, uh, our circuit breaker. So you buy online, but they can't supply you because the goods are in the store. So you can buy now, right? So every day they get about a thousand orders in the front, but you cannot get a fulfillment until the circuit breaker is broken. So I think you have that kind of issue. So how do you be ahead? For those who are able to do that faster, right, with an O2O -O and a back-end integration, they are able to continue. At least the e-commerce part will take away some of the shift from the, on, uh, the, 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 the offline business, right? So this is one uh, area. Also, okay. I think the second part we are talking about is uh, about cohesion among the tripartite partners, employers, government, Labor movement, for example, has already allowed us to work together. I mean, uh, when this thing happened, all of us are having a, a lot of work, talking to unions. Unions are concerned, you know, where employers do the do the 
obvious thing and just cut <laughs> cut workers straight away when this type of uh, thing happen. So we have a lot of things like looking at non-wage uh, uh, kind of a measures. Can we look at uh, them to work with certain uh, way? Can we promote some kind of flexible uh, work arrangement? And, and, and can we make them use uh, leave in advance? Or can we create certain kind of hours that they work and we, we take it from them as a credit? All those things without going to the last resort, which is actually retrenchment. Right? Yeah. So we're trying to, and that part, yeah, I, I think, think Robert, we, I think Robert, if I may interrupt, you're saying flexibility and partnership. And I think I can, we're getting that in every country. I'm going to yeah. move on, if we may, to the education experts. So we have some time for questions at the end. And I'm delighted to introduce Cindy Rampersard. Um, she joins us from London today. Um, she's not only uh, an executive board director, one of the world's largest education companies, um, but also Pearson, but she's also our newest director on the UK ASEAN Business Council. Cindy, it's great to have you here this morning. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and it's been a really great conversation um, this morning. So I want to start with um, a recent quote from a Harvard Business um, Review article, which I thought was very um, apt for the conversation we're having and also for the discussion around COVID. And the quote is, digital transformation is about talent, not technology. And so much of what we've heard today has been about people and actually marrying up human capital um, and talent with, with technology. Um, and one of the things, I guess, with regard to education is we hear a lot about the need to focus on the soft skills. So we've heard a lot about adaptability, flexibility, cultural awareness, but also the need to really think about the technical skills. But one of the things that the article says that I think is really relevant, and I've heard from um, Mr. Yap and, and, and um, uh, um, Anthony say, is that you know, technical skills very quickly become outdated. Um, in the current environment. And actually what you need to do is keep updating. So I think as we kind of come out of COVID, there are, there are several considerations um, and what the role of education is within that, education and learning, um, and, and how education and learning can really help to drive sustainable and inclusive economic and social mobility um, and what it means for the workforce. So the, the kind of key things that we're considering at the moment um, is that one of the biggest challenges will be around unemployment, both youth unemployment, but actually unemployment of adults in current industries that will be changing, displaced, pivoted. Um, and, and actually, how do we respond with education and learning to make sure that people are still relevant for the workforce? Um, the second impact is obviously um, the impact around GDP that we've heard from, from previous discussions. So Natalie Black talked about um, in most of the ASEAN nations, it was plus 5%, it's all being revised down to below 5% for many of the economies, not all. Um, so it's how, how does actually education and skills help to make sure that industrial strategy and growth um, comes back on track? And I guess the key consideration for us in, in terms of thinking about where we need to put our efforts in terms of curriculum and sectors, it's really thinking about some industries that might have been displaced in the short term. So we, we heard about tourism, travel and hospitality, but really thinking about the newer industries, um, you know, sustainability and environmental came up, healthcare and medical supplies um, and education as an enabler, but also digital feeding through all of that. And one other, the, the two other big areas, I guess, that have an implication around skills um, is the, the impact of insourcing potentially and displaced migration and what that means for the gig economy, for SMEs, and actually for really fostering entrepreneurship and enterprise. And again, Mr. Yap, you, you talked about that. Um, so what, what have we been seeing um, happening with education in the last couple of months. It's, uh, I think the, the pace has been quite um, phenomenal, like for everybody else. And, and we've seen a real acceleration of, of digital in education, but also in changing attitudes. So if I look at schools, first of all, um, there's been more um, movement towards online for digital learning and resources, but also looking at how we can support teachers and learn, teaching and learning. Um, there's been, and I think there's still work to be done on this. I think the the, the culture of face-to-face -face being the way to learn to actually online and blended being supportive, I think is 
it's still a journey we need to go on in some in some instances but i think we've seen some real movement that i think will be sustained i think in tertiary education we've already seen a movement um towards a, a, a greater acknowledgement that we needed technical and vocational education and um, that skills needed to be embedded and there needed to be greater engagement with employers and sector bodies around what the actual needs were um, for jobs now but also into the future in higher education the real risk is around travel and actually the reduction in travel um, that may happen over the next few years and how digital can support that and ensure people are still engaging with learning but i think one of the challenges around higher ed is also um, making sure the curriculum is relevant to the economy um, and and really what what we're seeing in some instances is a, as a top up so people doing their degrees and then a top up with vocational but i think the key area um, around education and learning is around lifelong learning um, we've heard this morning from from other panel members that jobs now are not necessarily the jobs of the future you know gps are now doing their services online consultants are doing their services online so there is this need to continually upskill to make sure that you're relevant for the workplace and and actually that and some of that learning is formal and informal um, and the responsibility i think has largely been driven by governments by employers um, but i think increasingly by individuals looking at actually how they how they upskill and how they remain relevant in the personal ownership piece and i think there are some dependencies um, there was a global learning survey that talked about enablers for lifelong learning it needs to be short it needs to be modular it needs to be accessible um, it needs to be affordable and actually it needs to be trusted in terms of credentials um, but at the heart of all of that is the role of digital and and digital as an enabler so I think, um, you know, this region, uh, ASEAN region, I think the predi prediction is that by 2030, it'll be the third largest workforce in the world. Um, if the numbers I've got are right, it's 385 million. Um, and, you know, the discussion about inclusivity and, and diversity, including women, including large businesses, including um, enterprise, I think in order to kind of create that ecosystem, education and learning will need to continue to be at the hub. Um, and, and for us, I think driving sustainable economic and social growth will be about CVET and vocational being embedded. It'll be about skills, soft skills. Um, it'll be about lifelong learning, which is continually updating for, for kind of um, the technical skills and industries moving. And it'll be about digital being at the heart of, of, of really what we do. So we see the role of education and learning really continuing to evolve but really supporting um, the economic recovery but also um, individuals really making progress in their lives. Cindy thank, thank you. you thank you for being so crisp. Um, I wanted to ask what you saw as emerging trends um, and industries that you're seeing in the region. Um, um, so I think um, it's it's things like um, agritech so around food and catering um, I think uh, increasingly looking at things like medical supplies. Um, I think sustainability and environmental has been slow, but I can see that coming on the agenda more. Um, and I think it's going to be looking at how digital crosses the key industries right now. So manufacturing, um, uh, construction, transportation, it's how how will digital become an integral part of all of those industries? And I think education and digital education is, is going to become an emerging sector as well. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Jonathan, can we move on to Jonathan Ledger, um, who is a DIT's TVET specialist? And so he reg reg regularly travels out to Southeast Asia for the department. Um, and has been involved in many of the discussions on this important um, area in the region. Um, Jonathan, over to you. Hello, everybody. What a great discussion, actually. It's, and it's always good that I think that technical and vocational skills get a really good profile because I firmly believe, like so many of the speakers, that actually this is the future for the majority of learners. Um, let me just give a quick introduction and I just want to cover a few key points as we go through. 
Um, the, as you know, the UK has long been a global leader in education with you know, renowned institutions and deep expertise across you know, schools, universities and technical and vocational English language. Um, so lots of different areas where we've contributed uh, to, our, to our own and to other people's success in terms of education going forward. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fact that the ASEAN region will have the largest youth population on the planet uh, by 2038. And, you know, Cindy already said, you know, the largest working population by 2050 or third largest in the world. And, and this will bring about big challenges. And, and I think the majority of those challenges will lie around skills for employment. So whichever kind of way you look at those skills and, and you know, absolutely lifelong learning is the way forward. It'll be that connectivity to work and jobs and and work types of all sorts. So whether it's working for an employer or working for yourself as an entrepreneur. And the thing is, with entrepreneurialism, um, you know, and I've worked in the furniture sector, for example, here in the UK, they're great craftsmen. They know how to pick up a saw and they can make you the best piece of furniture. And then they're not so good at business skills. So, you know, we have to kind of link in those other skills. And, and this was mentioned earlier. So it's it's not just about entrepreneurial skills. It's not just about core soft skills, you know, the language and, and the mathematics and all of those other uh, softer skills but also about business skills you know how to how to do marketing and and that was mentioned early on by Anthony he was talking about you know digital literacy CRM sales um, and all of those kind of good areas that really need some some looking at and uh, the the employer focus and the industry focus actually is critical whether it's a university whether it's a school or whether it is a technical and vocational training center college uh, private organization um you know if we're not giving people skills that enable them to have longevity in their careers then what are we doing and uh, you know it's a, a survey that was run in the uk and i use this around the world you know 75 to 80 percent of young people in primary education at the moment will do jobs in 20 years that have not yet been invented. And I always use an example of my mobile phone. So I'm holding up my mobile phone now, you know, and when I sat in a bank 30 odd years ago, these were the size of a car battery. And now look at what we can do with a mobile phone and you can run your life on this slim, small device. And I think that gives an example that really what we're trying to do here is to equip people with a bag of skills that are practical, long lasting and, and give them those kind of tenacity bits that we want them to have which is about being creative and being excited and dynamic and being able to turn on a on a on a coin and and go in the opposite direction if that is what's required and to to have research capability and and thought leadership and all of these kind of other almost untouchable things but we want to try and do that with TVET. the other part of the equation is that economies can't really afford higher education in the way that it's been done in the past and whether it's in the UK where actually the majority of people have to take out loans you know uh, and if we look at the two roots of that just as an example if you were to do um, academic qualifications in the UK by the time you leave uh, at the age of 23 24 you'd start your working life with 50,000 pounds plus worth of debt so it's really not a psychologically good place to start your working career if you go up the TVET route, you know, you can do an apprenticeship, have a job from day one, be paid from day one, and you end up at the age of 23, 24 with a degree and no debt. So which route would you rather choose? And I think increasingly what we're seeing and my engagement in the ASEAN region certainly is showing and demonstrating very clearly to me that, you know, economies can't afford this kind of higher education burden, whether it's, you know, from individuals paying it or governments paying it. And so there is this need for much more employer engagement, employer focus, and for employers to genuinely be heart, you know, at the heart of the skills system. So they know what they want, and the best way to find out is to talk to employers and to see what they need you know, in five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time, and to be working on that as a set of policies uh, and get them involved in the design work, you know, because often they will give up their time free of charge to be able to help you write, you know, qualifications, curriculum, whatever it is that is required. And I think it is that focus that, um, you know, is becoming more paramount. And for me, that's a, a mutually beneficial relationship because 
individuals will get what they want in terms of you know the right skills at the right time for the right kind of jobs and employers get what they want which is you know they really want skilled people that can turn up on day one and begin work and stay working so that's really important and to be kind of dynamic in that role and governments of course are looking for full employment as much as they can so you know everybody wins and most importantly actually the training providers colleges and universities have more life in them because they are delivering things that employers want therefore the demand is higher for years we've all been kind of working in a supply-led situation i guess and and actually the tables have turned and more so in recent years and and this thing about you know the digital skills and the technology and all of that I, I, you know i really am seeing this appear in lots of different sectors so you know, we all think ICT type sectors, computing type sectors, maybe even analytical type sectors. But, you know, we're working on projects um, and, I'll, and I'll, you know, come on to some of the detail, but we're working on projects where we're looking at digitalization in the marine sector, greening skills and digitalization in greening and how that kind of supports econ economic growth. Um, TVET systems in general, how do we turn, and this is a difficult question, but how do you turn competence assessments, which is really what drives the heart of technical and vocational education into an online process, because, you know, there are many students that live remotely from colleges and centres, and we need to be much more inclusive in the way that we, we engage with them through that. So uh, energy sectors, you know, all run by electricity, but, you know, many of these energy centres and power stations and that actually not as modern as you think and and so there is a transformation going on in those sectors and then of course we've got things like you know internet of things that run our lives and, and the big data and all of the the uh, key enabling technologies that come from that that we want to teach people but you know they don't sit on their own all of these things are woven into other industries and and you've got to remember that in most industries there are upwards of 300 different job roles and i bet you 95 percent of those job roles involve technology in some way so we're not talking about separation of sectors we're actually talking about integration of sectors and this is why the industry part the industry engagement in that is really important and just finally i'd just like to make the point about industry engagement if employers have a product which is skilled people that delivers what they need when they need it at the right time in the way that they need it they will contribute more financially to it and reduce the burden on governments and individuals. The problem is at the moment, we see so many times, and you started with this, um, Baroness, when you talked about, you know, skills that are not be, you know, delivering in the right way, so employers don't get engaged, and that's exactly the problem. It's, it's not doing what it says on the tin, so why should I bother? And what we want to try and do together is to create this mutually beneficial relationship where employers think, hey, I value, technical and vocational education and and then my very final point is and i always say this just because it's me um and cindy will know this look i'm a firm believer an absolute firm believer that tvet is a first choice every time choice not a second choice bad choice and and if we have anybody that thinks oh tvet is just for a particular class of people you need to change your picture because um i'm afraid you know tvet and skills is the way forward and actually i see that higher education and other sectors um, need to kind of hone in more on skills and we are seeing that happen. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, Jonathan, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to questions now and I'm going to actually, I've got a couple of questions. I'm going to start with you, Jonathan, um, because I think it's very much on what you've been saying. Um, if anybody got more questions, can you please put them into the chat? Because we want to make sure that we get some questions. But if I may, I'm going to address a couple of questions to the, to the panel. I'll start with you, Jonathan. Um, considering that governments and businesses will be reallocating their budgets to COVID, budgets for skill development for future types of work may not be a priority. How can we address these challenges with such limited resources, says Kogila Balakrishan. She also asked, what is the support given to SMEs with digital technology, as most big companies have better access to such platforms? Um, why don't we ask uh, Jonathan that? And um, uh, I don't know whether Robert would like to come in on that as well. Okay, so on the, on the budget question, I, I still think it comes back to this point about 
we have to be able to demonstrate the value to industry and then industry will support the development much more um, and if you know it's like anything whether you want a mobile phone or car or whatever it is that you need in your life there is this thing about a psychological thing about sometimes we buy what we need and sometimes we buy what we want and in fact uh, and, and this is picking up on Anthony's point about sales actually most of the times we make purchases we make purchases based on what we want rather than actually what we need because if we went on what we needed we wouldn't have half the things we have in our homes so so there is this thing about you know making sure that TVET is much more applicable and and actually this closer alliance between training providers and colleges and employers and we really don't see enough of that in in ASEAN it's something that is beginning to develop and and obviously all the governments that I talked to over the years have have said this in ASEAN and they really are trying to find ways to be to be able to do this more but I don't think it's about necessarily government budgets I think you have to kind of almost part that to one side in some respects this is about do employers want skilled people and how are they going to contribute to that picture Jonathan, thank you. Robert? Uh, Robert, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, great. Thanks. Sorry. You okay? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So the, <laughs> the COVID uh, part is actually uh, more uh, short term. I mean, you look at it, what the governments are also afraid that a lot of money is going to the COVID assistance, but everybody start to think very short term rather than long term. So we are trying to blend both. Right? Um, we have a number of programs, uh, programs like professional conversion uh, program that support salary, salary support up to almost 90%, depending on your age group. Mm -hmm. If you're above 40, the government subsidies support while training, all right, up to 90% of the payroll for nine months. So you have seen program like that. And also now they are actually more flexible because of COVID now, they even allow more flexible for companies to look at how you can, instead of retrenching uh, workers, use the time of this COVID with the incentives, with the grants to help reposition or reskill, right, uh, your 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 workers. I think this is the kind of thing that we are encouraging for the National Employers Federation. We are encouraging uh, our members. We are asking their members, even teaching them how to be able to apply for such scheme, so that while while they are all affected by COVID and where some of the jobs may be lost, we look at how to help them at this moment uh, transform or reskill right, their workers into an area where they could be actually more future ready. So this is the part that we are doing. Even to the extent of jobs that are not there, for example, uh, in this situation, a lot of companies cannot employ people. I mean, you don't have any, any place for headcounts, whatever it is. So what do you do? We even have a attach and train where where 100% of the salaries is actually being paid by the government on that basis, all right? So we train in advance. We train anticipating that within that six months, nine months, or 12 months period, that this thing will go over, and these people that are then trained and reskilled and trained will be ready for the jobs that happen at the point of time. Rather than allow them to be unemployed and go away, all right? Uh, then when the things turn, let's say in nine months time it turn, uh, you want to get them back again, you have to retrain them, and that, would not be actually a very positive thing. You're losing a lot of time on that basis. So there are quite a, quite a number of incentives in that area. Yeah. Robert, thank you. Um, I've got a couple more questions here, which I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to ask each panel member to respond, and perhaps to also to make any final remarks, because we are coming to the end of the period. So the, the two questions are actually contrasting. One is, how do you manage management by wandering about? Uh, this is from Martin Barrow, who many of you will know. Um, you know, it, engagement with people is incredibly important. How does one continue that uh, in the in in the new world? Um, and then the sort of contrary question is, um, you know, is how do you benefit from higher automation? You know, that the skills of automation are 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 obvious in terms of productivity. Um, you know, there's a lot of fear of automation and technology. Um, you know, is that something that's going to happen in Southeast Asia and will ASEAN be able to grow from that or will that be a problem? So shall we go, shall we go back to Onyanti, if we could, um, and ask her uh, to comment if you wish, but also to make any perhaps one final remark for, for the audience.
Um, okay, I'm probably going to answer just one of the questions, not on the automation, but um, just to look into how do you manage people moving around? Um, I, I think that's a, a very challenging, but I think one of those things is, again, trust. Um, it's something that is not being, being practiced, but um, you know that productivity nowadays, when we move around, we are more productive compared to really um, sometimes sitting in the office. I mean, this is what I've been through. And I thought like, you know, if you're stuck at home, you can't actually do much work, but you're more focused. And, and that's something that is something new that I actually um, foresee. So in, in a way, there is a good thing about being uh, mobile or being to, to work elsewhere remotely because you can really focus things uh, much, much better. Um, so that's, that's basically um, how, how, what I'm gonna um, actually reply. But um, as an end of statement is, when Brunei is gonna embark to our chairmanship next year, we are really looking forward to work together with our other joint business um, um, council to look into strengthening, again, what our discussion is about today. Um, again, we touch on the rescaling skill sets, TVET, um, we are very open and we look forward um, for our next adventure together. Thank you. Yeah, just thank you, Anthony. Uh, okay, um, I think with um, with all of this, it, it, it's about balance. Uh, and if I look at engagement, um, I think we will end up engaging with, with, with our own people and with our, our, our customers in slightly different ways. Uh, I think there will probably be less uh, less business travel, for example, but that means to me less time wasted in airports and more time having productive conversations with someone through this kind of um, technology platform. But I think this is a mindset shift as well. It, it's about um, all of us recognising how important that is uh, and not just paying lip service to it. Um, similarly, in, in, in relation to automation, again, it's a balance. Uh, the automation that is, is utilised will be based on decisions that people make. Uh, we will, without question, see certain job types, if not disappear, certainly reduce in the volume that we need, but we will see the creation of other job types to allow the effective use of the, um, of the automation. So I think we're, just, we're going to see an evolution, but I don't think things are going to change dramatically overnight. Um, what one perhaps um, thought to, to, to leave you with, which is something I've been speaking a lot about of late, is there was very much a war for talent coming into COVID-19 uh, and regardless of how slow the recovery may be, there will be a war for talent coming out. Thank you. I think that's true. Cindy. Um, so I think the, the point about um, human interaction, I think it is a challenge and I think um, human beings just by our nature, um, I think uh, interaction and face-to-face -face contact is is important but I think the productivity point um, that was raised is a really interesting one because what we've seen as an organization is increased productivity and I think going forward it will be that balance it won't be a, a, a spectrum of you know going to lots of meetings chasing meeting rooms down trying to get everybody together but actually being as adaptable as we have been today um, and then I think on skills and new roles I agree you know there'll be displaced roles there'll be change roles and there'll be new roles um and you know if i just think about the esports industry um that didn't exist um two three years ago um so i think it's about educating and making people feel comfortable of, around what the technology change means for them um in the context and actually their role um in enabling um technology and and really driving capacity and pace cindy thank you Jonathan? Uh, as somebody that's worked at home on and off for 20 years, I kind of almost find it a, a, a bit like business as normal, but I clearly recognise that many people have not been in the circumstance. And I think that, you know, that brings, you know, work challenges, uh, trust issues. Um, you know, employers have to learn to trust their employees and enable them to feel that they're still part of the business. There has always been this thing about, you know, we must see the heads we pay for. And I think there's a lot of people that like to do that. And and actually, I guess uh, COVID is really challenging that concept and their mindset around that. And it'll be interesting to see how that lasts afterwards. But I think, you know, um, homeworking is not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing you can do a lot more. And Cindy, you know, you talk about productivity, 
um, it is definitely much more productive. And I know that, you know, I'm not spent on time on a train and all of this kind of thing. And in an airport, as Anthony said, you know, I've spent many an hour uh, in an airport, as you can imagine. So I think, um, you know, home working for me is, is actually a bit of a liberation. I think it will be for many industries. What will be interesting is to see the impact on office space and offices and how uh mm. or companies treat their offices because you know you could potentially see a downsizing or something because actually you don't need a big office space and it'll be interesting to see what that challenge and what that concept brings about in terms of that particular sector finally just on um, a bit about um some of the stuff that we've just got going on in D in dit but our role essentially is to enable uk suppliers to engage with um, uh, ASEAN, uh, and that's at you know government level, institution level, and individual level. And we do that in lots of ways. But you know we have significant investment that we are working on in a mutually beneficial way with partners in ASEAN. Uh, so our prosperity fund, 20 million direct investment in technical and vocational education, for example. Um, at the moment, you know before COVID, so we'll see what happens afterwards. But 40,000 students a year from ASEAN. Um, British Council, you know, training 30,000 teachers and 300,000 students as well. So lots of different ways that we will engage. And I guess, um, you know, I would just say that if there's anything that people want to know about um, TVET, you know, there are many experts on this panel. And we're just really pleased to be able to support, you know, your ambitions. Thank you. And Robert. We can't hear you. The way that we are talking, I mean, the, in terms of face-to-face -face or or through this uh, kind of uh, web uh, interface, um, it's actually more a habit than anything else. I mean, a lot of us, uh, once you are into it, you feel that you're comfortable. In fact, you're more productive, right? For the people who are able to exploit that and use that properly, actually, it's more productive. Um, but many organizations, I think, uh, a lot of the more forward ones are already there, but many, huge percentage of them are actually not there. Some are trying to get there. I think this, this, uh, this, this time, I think it's a good time for us to try to push that through. And at the same time, it actually helps in a very important fundamental aspect of uh, employment. How do we allow people to actually uh, um, work from home? I mean, how do we create flexible work arrangement, right, as a practice in the organization? I think this is something that a lot of us want to do it, but because of trust factor, because of also the resistance to change your habits, so it's not there. But this COVID thing actually forces you to actually try it out, whether you like it or not. All right. So I think this is a, a, a good, good, uh, good turn. The other part on automation, I think uh, it is necessary. I think looking at the way that we are moving, I mentioned earlier on about the two part of the engine, the production and the consumption. Uh, a lot of this, you need a kind of a automation thinking to be able to exploit robots, uh, to be able to look at artificial intelligence, to be able to do a lot of things that you're talking about. So the converse side is always that, uh, then what happened to my workers, right? So does it mean that I get replaced? You know, I have that with the unions all the time because I'm sitting on the other side. So I always tell them, I said, you always wanted us to pay your workers more. How can we pay your workers more if productivity is not increased? So if we work together and train your workers properly to be able to, to go side by side right, with the automation uh, journey, then everybody wins. Right? The workers could be paid more because of higher productivity. They just have to be, be trained and upskilled to be able to do that. So I thought that is uh, 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 the way moving forward. And this is actually in line with what the future of work will entail. So the workers mentality must be able to accept things like that. And then everybody work in a trust environment, tripartite, government, uh, employers, and workers work together to make sure that we can all uh, have this uh, trust and win together. I think that's very Robert, important. Robert, that's a great point to end on because we, we've run out of time and I want to thank all of the panel and, and, and Dr. Kwong actually for, for his welcome. I think we can all look forward to the ASEAN Business Council um, sort of summit in Vietnam in November. And I think that this has only been the start of a conversation about the future of work. Um, it's very much struck me that COVID is actually an opportunity to promote some of these things like vocational education, lifelong learning, flexibility, all of the things that you were asking for. Um, and, you know, ASEAN, as I think Cindy said, is a, has a vast workforce. 
um, third largest workforce in the in the world. So all of that underlines for me the opportunity. But I think the, the big point is that we've got together, we've made a start. Um, there were some questions that weren't answered and I'll pass those on to the panel. So thank you very, very much indeed for your time. Um, thanks to, to Ross and to Alan and to the uh, UK ABC, but of course a special thanks also uh, to the ASEAN Business Council. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again um, on a further seminar and actually solving this problem of the future of work in the way that, 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 that promotes growth and promotes you know, a happy and effective and intelligent, talented workforce. Thank you all very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.